Goedenavond en welkom bij de tweede livestream van Lovels Instituut van dit jaar. Um, vorig jaar zijn er 13 van dit soort livestreams geweest en uh, we hopen dat dit jaar ook weer een hoop te kunnen doen. Uh, alle livestreams zijn terug te kijken via het YouTube kanaal van Lovels Instituut. Um, Logos is uh, een organisatie die wil graag heldere antwoorden geven op zaken die te maken hebben met geloof en wetenschap. Um, en dan gaat het ook om uh, nou ja, presentaties als deze die daar uh, aan bij kunnen dragen. Um, mocht u uh, voor kerk of school bijvoorbeeld een keer een spreker willen uitnodigen, dat zou ook nog uh, eventueel kunnen. Dan kunt u contact opnemen met Logos um, via de website. Kunt u daar uh, meer informatie over vinden. Uh, mijn naam is Nathan van Ree. Ik mag vanavond de livestream uh, presenteren. Althans, uh, introduceren beter gezegd. Want het echte presenteren wordt gedaan door professor Matthew McLean. Die vanavond uh, bij ons in de studio is. En aangezien hij Engels spreekt, ga ik nu ook proberen dat min of meer te doen. En dan uh, kan hij ook volgen wat ik zeg. Um, good evening, uh, Dr. McLean. Uh, welcome. And, um, perhaps uh, you will uh, you will do a, a live stream presentation uh, about birds and dinosaurs. How to respond to people who believe that birds evolved from dinosaurs. And um, during the uh, presentation, uh, the people at home can send in some questions and then we uh, can do a Q&A afterwards. So I can um, give you the questions uh, we receive here and then uh, Perhaps you can um, answer them as well as you can. And um, we'll we're very obliged of, uh, to have you here. And um, very, um, very uh, interested in uh, what you have to say. So perhaps you could start with uh, introducing yourself and then um, the floor is yours. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much for having me here. Um, it's uh, great to be able to do this, and I was um, honored to be invited. And um, yeah, so I'm uh, Matthew McLean. I'm a professor at the Masters University in Southern California. It's where I am right now. Um, so a little bit of a different time zone from you guys, but um, I am a vertebrate paleontologist. So I get to work on dinosaurs and pterosaurs and other fossil animals, which is really fun. And I get to train students. And here at the Masters University, we are committed to um, teaching what the scriptures say um, and seeing scripture as our foundation. And so, um, you know, this is a, a great school for those who want to study the sciences from a biblical perspective. Um, they're going to get to do that here. And um, we get to do students in biology as well as geoscience um, and train them um, you know, in, in those fields um, from a biblical perspective so they can go out into the world and make discoveries, which is great. Um, Sounds great indeed, yes. Yeah, so uh, I'm also the president of the Creation Biology Society, um, which is a, a creationist um, science group. We have a creation geology society and theology society. We meet together jointly each summer and um, they have what's called the origins meeting. And this year we're putting it together with the International Conference on Creationism, which is happening in July in Cedarville University at Cedarville, Ohio, um, which if you're interested in creation science or all, at all, that's the place you want to be. That's that's where yeah. new things are happening. It's great. Um, so uh, should I go ahead and start us off? If you would like to, um, we're very eager to hear what you have to say. Okay. Um, so yeah, um, I was brought here to talk about how to respond to evolutionists who say birds evolve from dinosaurs. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look at that. Um, I assume most of you are pretty familiar with the idea that, um, evolutionists believe that birds did indeed fall from, um, dinosaurs. Um, so you'll see some kind of graphic like this. This is an old one. I remember seeing this in National Geographic. I don't know where the original came from. I tried to find it. Um, but you can see there the idea that you're starting with um, kind of small uh, dinosaurs we call theropods. They're, they're typically meat-eating dinosaurs that run around on two legs, um, very lightly built, hollow bones, things like that. And that they're supposed to evolve feathers, eventually wings, and become birds. Um, and creationists have been quick to jump on this um, and, and even mock this at times. Um, in this particular illustration from Dinosaurs by Design, 
uh, by Dwayne Gish is actually about the evolution of pterosaurs, not birds. But it's the same idea, right? What use is half a wing? Um, how would something like this actually happen? How could you really evolve a non-flying creature into a flying creature? Um, and I think that's a good question. And so like anything, when we're dealing with issues of origins, what we want to do is come back to what do the scriptures say? Um, and in fact, scripture does teach us about the origin of birds in particular. Um, it says that God created the birds on the fifth day of creation. Now, the word bird isn't actually in that text. It says flying animals. Um, it's a word that they would use for that. Uh, birds would be included in that, probably bats, and we would we would assume pterosaurs and some other flying animals like that. Um, and then it says that God made the land animals on the next day, on the sixth day of creation, uh, it tells us in Genesis 1. Um, so I think it's a pretty obvious conclusion that a bird cannot evolve from a land animal. Um, the, the flying animals that are created on day five have a separate origin than the land animals on day six. Um, so, you know, we see birds appear first and then um, land animals like most of our dinosaurs would appear afterwards. Um, and so this is the complete opposite picture from what the evolutionary account would say for the origin of these creatures. So now that we have a good understanding kind of of the basic idea of the evolutionary model and the basic idea of what, what scripture would say here, um, I want to show you kind of where we're going with the rest of this presentation. Um, the first thing we need to do is answer the question, why do evolutionists think that birds evolve from dinosaurs? Where does that idea come from? Um, certainly, you know, when you see Jurassic Park and you see a T-Rex or a Triceratops or something like that, like you don't think, oh, that's a bird. Like th it's very different. So where do they get that idea from? And then secondly, we want to address the question of how should creationists respond to this? We talked about what the scriptures say. Um, but we also need to think through what do we do with scientific data um, and how do we reason through those things. So we're going to talk about that today. Um, and I just want to show you um, just a cool example. This is a fossil um, that was found in uh, Myanmar, Burma. Um, it's a small piece of amber that has a feathered tail inside of it. Um, and you can also see there's some ants in there too. And we can uh, zoom in on these and see these incredible feathers that are preserved in this. Um, now, unfortunately, a lot of this amber is um, obtained uh, in not ethical ways. And so there's whole debates about how we should publish on this and everything. But it's out there. And I want you to see that because this is not only showing the beauty of God's creation right here, but it poses lots of questions. What is this long bony tail doing with feathers on it? Um, the scientists who published on this, they said, we think this is a dinosaur tail with feathers. Um, so how do we think through something like that? Well, if we're going to understand... Um, the connection between birds and dinosaurs and why evolutionists think that they uh, that birds came from dinosaurs, we need to go back to the first fossil that started this whole discussion, and it's, that's Archaeopteryx. Okay, so Archaeopteryx um, was originally discovered in the 1860s. Um, the first fossil with a skeleton of Archaeopteryx um, is what's called a London specimen. Um, that one was described by Richard Owen in 1863. Um, he gave it the name Archaeopteryx, which means ancient wing. Um, and then in 1868, Thomas Henry Huxley, who was known as um, Darwin's bulldog, jumped on this um, creature as a transitional form between dinosaurs and birds. Now, Richard Owen just thought it was kind of a weird bird. Um, why did Huxley assume this was a transitional form? Um, well, as you can see really clearly in this beautiful specimen called the Berlin specimen, it's found a little bit later, um, there are some obvious bird characteristics. Like, for instance, there's feathers there. You can see feathers coming off of the arms. You can see feathers coming off of the tail. And by the way, this is a picture of a reproduction of it. The real one, like I said, is in Berlin. Um, the Archaeopteryx also had a furcula. Um, you may know that as the wishbone. Um, that's what you find in birds. But it also had some very unusual characteristics that are more common in things like dinosaurs. For instance, it has a long bony tail. You can see it there. Modern birds do not have this, right? Um, any of you have ever prepared a turkey before in the oven or a chicken or something, you know, like there's not this long bony tail that you'd have to like get out of the way to fit it in the oven, right? It's just not there. Birds have really, really short bony tails um, that are fused together. It's called a pygo style. Um, and Archaeopteryx does not have something like this. It's very different. It's kind of like what you see in dinosaurs. Um, additionally, Archaeopteryx has three clawed digits on its hands. Um, you can see them there. 
We don't think of birds as having claws, although it turns out that actually many, many species of birds have claws on at least one of the fingers um, in the wing. Um, but there is a species of bird called the Huatzin. The juveniles do have clawed digits that they actually use to help climb up trees. Um, and then there's teeth. Okay, so no living bird has teeth. Birds have a beak. You might see a bird that's got like a serrated beak or something, but you don't see any teeth in birds. Um, teeth you do find in reptiles and you know, animals like dinosaurs. And so um, this is why Huxley jumps on this. Look, it's got bird characteristics. It's got dinosaur characteristics. You know, it's got to be a transitional form. Owen, who was no fan of Darwin, thought, no, it's just a really weird looking bird. Um, interestingly, there was another researcher at the time um, named, I, I don't know if it's Wagner or Wagner. I don't know how, what he went by. But he said that, um, actually, I think this is a reptile. And the things we're calling feathers are some kind of weird skin structure that just looks like feathers. So even from the moment it was found, there were these different positions. And these positions have kind of stayed with us to the present. Um, people debating what exactly is this creature. And this is the 1860s. So this is a long time ago. Um, and we didn't get a lot of fossil evidence in between that helped us understand it. Uh, it's really, you have to jump ahead a century to get anything that really helps you understand what's going on here. And that's the discovery of Deinonychus. Um, now you may not have heard of Deinonychus, means terrible claw. Um, it was described in the 1960s by John Ostrom. Here's a skeleton of Deinonychus. Um, you probably are familiar with one of its close relatives, Velociraptor. Um, it's in the same family. It's called the Dromaeosauridae. Deinonychus is a bigger animal, um, whereas Velociraptor is a much, much smaller animal. We'll talk about that later. Um, and Ostrom, when he was looking at Deinonychus, he realized it shared a lot of features in common with birds. And you might say, well, it doesn't really look like a bird like that. Well, I agree. But Deinonychus has a backward-facing pubis, its hip bone. Um, and you can see it, let me see if I can get a little laser pointer here for you. There you go. Um, you can see this bone right here in most dinosaurs, most of our, our theropod dinosaurs, it points forward, but here it points backwards, which is the condition in birds. Um, additionally, Deinonychus has a wishbone, a furcula, and, um, it has hollow bones as do our other theropods. Um, and that's something you find in birds. So that's really interesting. Here's a comparison of the hand of Deinonychus and the hand of Archaeopteryx. And you'll notice they're incredibly similar. I mean, Archaeopteryx bones are skinnier. They're kind of more dainty, but they look very, very, very similar in their shapes. Um, and so John Ostrom puts all this together and he says, I think that birds evolved from dinosaurs. He's carrying over this idea that Huxley had back in the 1860s. Um, but even then, there's not much to go on here. What people really wanted to find were, you know, fossils of dinosaurs with like feathers on them or something like that. That would be that would be the the best case scenario. And sure enough, in the 1990s and early 2000s, some amazing fossils started to be found in the country of China in the region of Liaoning. Um, so this is Sinosauropteryx. This was the first one to kind of kick off the whole thing. It was described in 1996, um, and it has this fuzz, um, and you can see it running along the back, along the neck and the tail going up there. Um, and they said, uh, people who found this said, we think that this is some kind of um, proto feather is what they called it, like an ancestor to the feather. Um, then later they found Sinornithosaurus, which was similarly covered with these things. It was a dromaeosaurid, so same group as Velociraptor and Deinonychus we talked about. And it also um, later was found to have some true feathers on it, um, which you can see in this fossil right here. Um, so how common is this? How many dinosaurs do we now know that have feathers or feather-like integument coverings on their bodies? So um, just looking at this chart here, you can see um, that most of our dinosaurs with any kind of feathery kind of thing are in our theropod group. Um, there are a lot of them that have what we call plumulaceous feathers. So that's kind of like, um, kind of like body feathers. Um, you might think about like, uh, when you think about a chick or a duckling or things like that, some of the downy fluff as well as some other feathers that are just close to the body. Those are different from what we call our pinaceous feathers. That's the stars here. Those are feathers that would be like wing feathers, okay? Um, all of that kind of stuff is found in various dinosaur groups, okay? Our birds being down here. Um, so that's really interesting. In fact, over 50 different um, taxa of feathered dinosaurs have been discovered. So 50 different species genera of 
feathered dinosaurs. Um, so this is not like a, a one little thing here. And some of these animals, we'll see later things like Microraptor or Anchiornis, there are sometimes dozens to hundreds of specimens of these. So this, this is a, a um, very well-known phenomena now. I'll just show you some examples. We can't spend a ton of time on this. I don't want to take up all the time, but of course it's cool to see what's out there and um, to see what God has made. Uh, here's a well-known one. This is Caudipteryx. Um, this is a cast um, that was on display, but you can see here um, the feathers coming off of the tail as well as feathers coming off of the hand. Um, this animal is an oviraptorosaur, um, which are mainly toothless. They got beaks, um, they're theropods. You can see this clump of what looks like rocks in the stomach. They are rocks. Um, these are gastroliths. So sometimes animals swallow uh, pebbles or gravel or sand or things like that. Like chickens will do this, crocodiles will do this. Um, it can help with digestion. Um, in the case of uh, crocodiles and some aquatic animals, it can also help we think with ballast. Um, but uh, some dinosaurs were doing that, which is cool. Um, here's a therizinosaur called Bapiosaurus. Um, therizinosaurs are these really um, bizarre looking dinosaurs. They're kind of, um, I, I kind of think of them as like the dinosaur version of a ground sloth. Um, they've got these really big claws in their hands, scythe lizards, the idea. Um, long necks um, with beaks, but teeth there as well, plant eating teeth, um, really stumpy legs, um, just big animals all the way around. If you saw uh, Jurassic World Dominion, um, they have a Therizinosaurus in that. It's got the really, really big claws on its hands. Um, so here is a smaller relative of that animal um, from China. And you can see all kinds of interesting stuff coming off of its body. Um, kind of some uh, fuzzy kind of stuff there. It's also got what look like almost like quills. Um, some kind of weird filament coming off of um, the tail area. So really, really interesting um, outside coverings to these animals. Uh, I'll give you some more examples. Talk about ornithomimosaurs. These are the ostrich mimic dinosaurs. Um, if you saw the original Jurassic Park, um, it's the Gallimimus, the ones that are running in the big herd and they have to run away from them. Um, so in 2015, uh, they found a fossil of a densely feathered Ornithomimus um, from the Dinosaur Park formation. So you can see some feathers right here. They had found in the bones these little black spots. And they realized that these were spots where the feathers were originally um, coming off of there. And um, other teams started to find these on Ornithomimus fossils. And actually, they found out there were specimens of Ornithomimus they had found in Canada back in 2008 that had these like wispy streaks coming off of the arms. And they joked when they found it, they're like, oh, maybe there are feathers. And like, well, it's not China. They can't be feathers. And then this later researchers found they were saying, hold on a minute. Maybe these were feathers. And they went back and looked. And they found out that a specimen from way back in 1995 had these things on them. And nobody noticed because they didn't know what to look for. They had no search image. And so they weren't realizing that these things actually had feathers on them. Um, we can also look at a very interesting group of dinosaurs called the Scansoriopterygids. This particular one is called Yichi. Um, this is a 3D print uh, copy of the original fossil from China. And you can see the head right here and the neck. You see the fuzz coming off everywhere. Um, and you can see it's got a very strange situation with uh, one really long finger, as our um, scantoropterygids do, as well as a membranous wing, essentially. So this is a very interesting creature, very unexpected creature. Um, and they're not very big, by the way. Um, they're, they're, you could easily, you know, put one of these in your purse kind of thing. Um, but some very cool stuff going on here. And then we'll look at one we've brought up a few times, but haven't spent any time on Velociraptor. So that's the Velociraptor you're probably familiar with um, from Jurassic Park, but there's lots of problems in Jurassic Park. For instance, the Velociraptors are way too big. Um, you know, really the animals in Jurassic Park are the orange sized animal here, but a Velociraptor is actually in the blue down here, come up to about your knee, okay? Um, the big animal here that is the size of Velociraptors in Jurassic Park is called Utah Raptor. Um, it is a real animal, um, but, it is uh, it's in the same family, uh, Dromaeosauridae. And turns out they started to study fossils of Velociraptor. They looked at, here's one of the arm bones, and they found these little bumps that were regularly um, spaced. And they correspond really well to things we see in modern birds that are sites for feather attachment. And so um, scientists proposed that, yeah, it looks like Velociraptor had feathers. Um, and so a Velociraptor would look much more like this as opposed to what you see in Jurassic Park. And actually the new Jurassic World Dominion movie, they did put feathers on, on one of the dromaeosaurids in that movie. 
Um, now you say, well, are bumps really enough to convince us that there's feathers? And I think that's a good question, right? Um, just some similarities there can we automatically assume. But we do have feathered dromaeosaurids. Um, the most spectacular example of these probably is Microraptor, um, a dinosaur that was known previously without feathers um, as the fossils were coming out of China. They recognized it as a dromaeosaurid. And then they started to find fossils that had feather imprints on them, and they're spectacular. Um, you can see huge feathers coming off of the, the arms there to make wings. You can see long feathers coming off the legs, which is a little bit surprising, as well as feathers coming off of other parts of the body, um, even out to the tail. And there are tons of fossils of this. Um, here is a close-up of um, the same specimen in a different light. Um, and you can see it's just really, really amazing preservation on this thing. Now, I've shown you lots of examples of theropod dinosaurs with feathers and feather-like structures on their bodies. Um, but I'd also like to show you that there are some dinosaurs that are not theropods, so not thought to be closely related to birds at all in the evolutionary model, um, that also have some interesting things on them. So here's Cetacosaurus. Um, this is a relative of Triceratops. It's about the size of a Labrador. Um, and this is a really well-preserved fossil where you can see um, original coloration patterns, skin shapes, and just everything you can imagine. It's really cool. But check out the tail over here. There's like something funky going on back here. Um, and sure enough, uh, it looks like it had some kind of like filaments coming off here, some quills or something. Um, just really interesting kind of thing going on. Uh, we also have um, a close relative called Kalindodromia. I say close relative, in the same group, Ornithischia. Um, and it has some interesting scales going on. It's got some of these filaments coming off. It's even got some filaments that seem to kind of come out from the scales or near the scales. Um, so dinosaurs are a lot more um, creatively, uh, how do I say, dressed than maybe we originally thought. Uh, we tend to think of them as just scaly kind of animals, um, but there's a lot going on here, and that's really exciting. And it's not just dinosaurs either. Um, you might think of a pterodactyl as a dinosaur, but actually it's not. It's in a group called Pterosauria. And pterosaurs for a long time, ever since, um, they've been recognized widely ever since the, the 70s, that they had um, a fuzz on them that we've called pycnofibers. Um, so this is an anarognathid specimen um, from China, and you can see all kinds of fuzziness on this fossil. This is either, uh, they're zooming in here from um, the specimen. In fact, they were able to discover structures called melanosomes on this fossil. Melanosomes are um, organelles and cells that um, part of the reason an animal has the color that it has. And based on the shape of it, you can actually um, start making guesses as to what colors um, these animals were. And so this particular anarognathid probably had a lot of browns on it. Um, and this is really cool, right? <laughs> this is preserved at all. I mean, it's incredible. Um, and so these scientists looking at this specimen started to say, we think that these might be homologous with feathers. What they mean by that is they think they may be the same type of structure, um, you know, that are in pterosaurs and in dinosaurs and in birds. Um, and so they started to refer to these things as feathers. There was some fighting about this, um, but a really recent specimen of the pterosaur Tupandactylus um, from Brazil shows that um, there are in fact branching pycnofibers that look a lot like feathers. Um, and so these authors said, yeah, we think that these things are actually feathers. Um, they're different looking feathers than most of our modern feathers, but there's a lot of similarities. So given everything we just looked at, how should a creationist respond to this? Well, we already know what scripture says that there are, you know, birds are made a day before the land animals. We also know that um, birds are, there's different created kinds of birds. Even Genesis 1 talks about that God made different kinds of flying things. So we know they don't all share a common ancestor in real time um, or in deep time. So some creationists um, have immediately jumped to the idea of questioning the evidence. Now, I don't want to paint that necessarily in a bad light because that's what we should do as science and scientists, right? Like as someone publishes some new science, my first thought is going to be things like, okay, do the methods check out? Like, can I be confident they interpreted the structures correctly? Like we should be doing that, right? That's how science works. And so when these things started to get published, people were a little bit suspicious with good reason. Um, and one of the reasons that's often given for why we shouldn't trust any of this is because there have been hoaxes. There have been fake fossils. So this is a famous example of an animal called Archaeoraptor. 
Um, so the story behind this is that the paleontologist who acquired this from China, um, he was really excited about this, wanted to publish it. Um, he sought out another paleontologist and the guy said, slow down, man. Like, let's go through the peer review process and everything. And he just said, no, I'm going to go contact National Geographic. So they contacted National Geographic and, um, you know, they, they did a front page story about this dino bird and nope, it's actually a, um, fabricated fossil. So you can see it's made up of a bunch of different chunks here. It's like a jigsaw puzzle, right? So the top part here, um, belongs to an Indian tornithine bird, um, found in those locations. And the bottom here belongs to Microraptor. Um, so actually it kind of still is a feathered dinosaur. It's just two different creatures glued together. Um, so a true feathered dinosaur and, and a bird. Um, and so some people have used Archaeoraptor as like, see, we shouldn't trust any of it. So some people have doubted that Archaeopteryx, you know, they said maybe that's not a real um, feathered or, you know, feathered creature. Maybe the fossils are fake. Archaeopteryx has been tested and tested and tested. There's about 12 specimens known right now. Um, and, you know, these things have um, gone through X-ray synchrotrons, everything you can imagine. They're legitimate. Um, and not only that, there's actually original preserved material from the feathers in some Archaeopteryx specimens. And that material shows melanosomes and they be able to figure out they probably have black feathers. That's really cool, right? Um, so we shouldn't automatically jump to the conclusion that, oh, maybe all these things are fake. No. And I want to point out, you know, the people that figured out that this was a fake fossil, it wasn't creationists. It was evolutionists. They want to do good work. They, they're they interested in facts and understanding facts just like we are. Um, so we got to realize that. So this also came into play with a lot of those feathered dinosaurs coming out of China that didn't have, you know, penaceous feathers on them. They had like this fuzzy stuff, right? So like Sinosauropteryx, you can see right here. Um, and so some people started to say, well, hold on. Um, is that really anything like feathers? So one of the popular ideas was that um, the fuzziness that was on Sinosauropteryx was actually from decay. And the idea was that as the animal started to decay, you had these collagen fibers that were... Um, coming off of the body, and that's what makes that fuzziness. It's actually not something originally on the outside of the body. Um, well, that's a hypothesis, and we can test that, right? And scientists did. So they looked at Sinusauropteryx material um, under different uh, mechanisms from looking at uh, microscopes and, and other kinds of things, and they were able to see that the filaments are actually hollow. Um, and so these are not collagen fibers. Not only that, they had melanosomes on them. Um, like we said, the color producing things and that, that kind of stuff is only found on the outside of the body. And so it was really cool. They were able to discover that with Sinusauropteryx, there's a banded tail on it, kind of like a red panda, that it switches from like an orangish color to a white to an orange to a white going along the back of the tail. That's pretty cool. Um, but these are outside structures. So um, we can confirm that, no, there are genuinely um, fossils of animals we've called dinosaurs that have feathers and other kinds of fuzzy feather-like integument on the outside of the body. Um, and that's definitely the case. Okay, so another possibility is that we question the taxonomy. And we saw this happening with Archaeopteryx from the moment it was discovered. Is it a bird? Is it a dinosaur? Is it something else? Um, and so people have always tried to figure this out. Well, so one solution some creationists have taken is they said, if a fossil is found with feathers, it's a bird. But if it's found without feathers, it's not a bird. Okay, now obviously you have to keep in mind, you know, you've got uh, what we call taphonomy issues, so how something's preserved, right? So you can find fossils of birds today that have no feathers on them, right? Because, you know, the feathers washed away before it was buried or, you know, various reasons like that. Um, but this ends up with some really kind of bizarre situations. Um, so for instance, um, this is Microraptor we talked about earlier. Um, and so many creationists want to call this a bird because it has feathers on its body. But Deinonychus and Velociraptor and other animals from the same family as Microraptor, they want to call a dinosaur. And so that's kind of unusual, right? That's not really how we should do taxonomy. I mean, if two species are anatomically similar enough to be placed in the same family, we can't then separate them out into two different classes just based on a single feature, whether or not they have feathers. And the reality is we do have large dromaeosaurids that show feather material um, that have been coming out of China recently. So, um, and I say large, I'm saying velociraptor sized ones. Um, 
So yeah, I don't really think that's a reliable way to look at these things. Um, I think you need to call it what it is. Um, you know, if it looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, it's a duck, right? If it's a dinosaur, skeletally, and we've always considered a dinosaur, then yeah, I think we've got a dinosaur with feathers and it's okay to say that. So if questioning the evidence hasn't solved this and questioning the taxonomy hasn't solved this, maybe what we need to do is rethink our assumptions. Because like all scientists, evolutionists or creationists, we come to evidence with assumptions built in. Um, and one assumption that we come to the fossil record with is we often assume that um, the animal categories that we have alive with us today encompass all the creatures that have ever existed. And so what happens is we tend to shoehorn fossils into modern categories when we instead should allow um, what exists to determine our categories, right? So um, I previously have done a presentation with Lagos Institute um, about non-mammalian synapsids. Um, these animals that are supposed to be uh, supposedly transitional between reptile-like creatures and mammals. So like Cynognathus, you can see right there, that's the skull of it. Um, these animals have traits of both reptiles and mammals, which is why they're sometimes called reptile -like, or mammal-like reptiles, even though they're not technically reptiles. Um, so instead of denying that there's similarities between reptiles and mammals with the synapsids, right? Um, we should say what's there. Hey, they've got some traits that are like mammals and they've got some traits that are like reptiles. That's what's there. That's okay to say that. Now the evolutionist says the only reason we would find both traits of reptiles and mammals in synapsids is because they're transitional from reptile-like creatures to mammals. But the creationists can reject universal common descent while still acknowledging that there are similarities. And the same is true with dinosaurs and birds. There's, there's nothing anti-creationist or anti-biblical about a dinosaur having feathers, right? There's nothing anti-creationist or anti-biblical about dinosaurs and birds sharing features in common. I mean, after all, all living things share features in common, right? I mean, we, we can't go down that rabbit hole. That's not going to lead us anywhere. Um, so instead, what we need to do is affirm taxonomic relationship without automatically assuming common descent. So we can talk about things like mammals, right? Mammal is a real group. It's animals that have fur and produce live young for the most part and produce milk. Um, we recognize that. It's easy for a child to recognize that. But is mammal a created kind? No. In fact, does mammal, as we currently understand it, include kinds that are created on different days of the creation week? Yes, right? Bats are flying animals that would have made on day five. You know, um, a lion is a land mammal. It would have made on day six, its ancestor. Um, so we can see that our categories don't automatically transpose right over to Genesis, right? We need to realize that um, Moses isn't trying to establish for us a taxonomic scheme um, that we can use to classify all living things. Um, Moses is just telling us in Genesis, hey, here's here's what God made on each day. He made some flying stuff and swimming stuff, and he made some land stuff. Like, that's, that's what he's saying. Um, and so we as scientists have the job of thinking through how these things are related, but we need to be careful not to confuse taxonomy classification with um, origins, okay? So for instance, there's actually nothing wrong with saying a bird is a type of dinosaur if you wanted to. Um, if you wanna think about the group Avametatarsalia that includes dinosaurs and birds and, and pterosaurs as maybe all these animals have feathers or feathery-like integument on them. And then birds are just one particular kind of that, just like a bat is a particular kind of mammal. Um, I'm not saying that birds evolved from dinosaurs, certainly they did not. But the point is, we've come at this with assumptions, and those assumptions have tripped us up. And they haven't allowed us to see God's glory displayed in this particular way, which is really cool. And we want to be excited about that. So now that we're kind of thinking as a creationist scientist and running with this, how do we want to actually respond to the evolutionists, right? That was, that was what I was supposed to talk to you about, and I haven't gotten there yet. Um, since we know birds did not evolve from dinosaurs, since we've got feathered dinosaur fossils now, we've kind of rethought our assumptions and allowed for that possibility to exist. How do we then respond to an evolutionist who says, well, a feathered dinosaur is proof, you know, that birds evolved from dinosaurs. So let's work through that. Number one, 
I want to point out that um, if you're talking to an evolutionist, the way they're thinking about evolution happening is continuity, right? So what that means is um, you can make a grand tree of life, and that tree of life um, connects every living thing that's ever existed, right? And you can trace it all back, and you should be able to find continuity between all these creatures, right? So there should essentially be an unbroken spectrum from basal theropods all the way to modern sparrows, okay? That's kind of the way that we should think about it. And um, the evolutionist says that's what we should see. Yet, when we've done um, statistical baromenology, we have found that it is not an unbroken chain from dinosaurs to birds. In fact, we find abundant evidence for discontinuity separating out various dinosaur and bird-created kinds. Um, as I say there on the screen, we found evidence for at least eight different kinds of feathered dinosaurs. So you look at this um, this chart over here that shows uh, different um, dinosaur theropod dinosaur groups and um, birds on there as well. And I apologize, I don't know where this um, image came from, um, but you can see these different groups. And surprisingly, as we did our baronology, it turns out, yeah, pretty much each one of these recognizable distinct groups looks like a created kind, which makes sense, right? We automatically recognize it. I don't mistake a therizinosaur for a dromaeosaurid or a alvarosaur for an ornithomimid. Like it's, it's pretty easy to tell them apart. And sure enough, they look like they're surrounded by discontinuity. They're distinct from other creatures and they're probably close to a created kind. In some cases, like with troodontids and dromaeosaurids, they might be a single created kind together. That's not shocking. They're pretty similar animals. And of course, we already knew there were multiple created kinds of birds. So this is cool. Instead of seeing this unbroken chain of one thing evolving into the next, we can see real discrete units here, which is what the creationists would predict. Now, the evolutionists might reply with, well, I mean, it could just be gaps in the fossil record, right? Okay. Fair enough, like that, that's a, a hypothesis and we could look into that, but we've got tons of feathered dinosaur fossils now and we're still finding these very distinct groups. And that's encouraging to me as a creationist. And I mentioned statistical baromenology, just show you kind of what these plots look like. Um, this is looking at Oviraptorsaurus, these dinosaurs right here. Um, and you can see these black squares and, and these open circles here. Um, this chart is kind of difficult to read, takes a while to get used to looking at it, but imagine, see there's a the diagonal here. Um, what you want to think about is uh, that this is a mirror of this side. And you can see the names of the animals right here, like you recognize Velociraptor and Archaeopteryx right there. And then down here, a bunch of Oviraptorsaurs. Um, imagine with me that these names are also along the top of here. Okay. And so, um, if you think back to the day when we had atlases, okay, we'd use road atlases when we're driving around and stuff, um, they'd have these charts that would be mileage, okay? And so they'd say like, if you want to drive from, oh, sorry, my cursor's getting a little crazy here. You know, if you want to drive from Paris to Bordeaux, okay, for instance, um, then, you know, if you're driving from Paris to Paris, well, that's stupid. There's gonna be nothing there, right? And that's this diagonal line right here. So how does Velociraptor compare with Velociraptor? I mean, it, it's a perfect comparison, right? So you just get a black square here. But how does Velociraptor compare with Hererosaurus? So that would be like the distance from Paris to Bordeaux. And then you'd have a number there, right? Um, and so that's kind of how this works. And so um, these three guys up here are not over raptor source. And lo and behold, they show, see these circles? They're showing difference when compared to all these guys, which are over raptor source. So that's what we call evidence for discontinuity there. Whereas our over raptor source, all these guys are oviraptorids. They have really strong evidence of continuity. They're very similar. And then there's some other oviraptorsaurs that are more difficult to interpret down here. And this chart up here is easy to understand. It's called uh, multidimensional scaling. And the idea is that these data sets that we use have hundreds of characters in them. And um, then that's taken by the program. And each of those characters is treated as a dimension in space. So you could have like hundreds of dimensions. Well. We can't visualize hundreds of dimensions as humans. And so it's reduced down to three dimensions with a certain amount of stress on the data. And you're looking for clustering patterns. So look at all over Raptor source clustering over here in pink. They're very close to each other. They have a lot of similarity. They're very far away from things like Velociraptor, Archaeopteryx, and Herrerasaurus. Well, that's cool. There's a huge gulf here. Now, are our over Raptorids in the same group as some of these other Raptorsaurs or Anzu up here? I don't know. And that's future work might fill in those gaps, might leave those gaps intact. 
But the point is, we can see real clustering patterns here, and we can see evidence for discontinuity. I can be very confident, I think, that oviraptor sores are not in the same created kind as Archaeopteryx or Velociraptor. And that's cool. That's unpredicted from the evolutionary model, but it fits really well with the creation model. So our first point in responding to the evolutionists, yeah, I don't see evidence of unbroken continuity from dinosaurs to birds. The second thing we can note in responding to an evolutionist about dinosaurs and birds is the unexpected stratigraphic order of dinosaurs and birds. So what do I mean by that? Let me explain. You can see here our geologic column, okay? Um, and you see a lot of these names associated with millions of years, um, and they are, but you can also use them just in the sense of talking about the layers of rocks that are out there, okay? That's how we're going to think about them. Um, so these rocks were laid down most recently. These rocks at the bottom were laid down um, in the ancient past, way, way back, okay? So um, when you look at dinosaurs evolving into birds, if you're thinking that's going on, you have to evolve feathers, right? And so there's all these different feather morphologies we see in the fossil record. And, and some of these might be um, misunderstood. Like, for instance, this one's probably a feather that's um, in very young stages. And so it's losing its sheath there. And that's why it looks funny. Um, you know, this one might just be like um, a downy feather that's been like smashed and looks funny. But regardless, there's different feather types in the fossil record and in today. So as an evolutionist, you're going to predict feathers are going to start with something like this, a single filament right? And then they're going to get more and more complex as you move forward till eventually you get like the asymmetrical pinaceous feather you find in, in flying birds, okay? Um, so if that's the case, that feathers have this evolution, and by the way, they name a lot of these fossil feather types as evolutionary stages. They'll call it a stage 2A feather or a stage 2B feather, that kind of thing. So um, if you're imagining this evolutionary scenario going on, you would expect that these kinds of feathers, the single filaments, should show up first in the fossil record, right? And then these should show up later because they take time to evolve. So let's actually look at the fossil record. What do we see? Single filament and kind of clumped filaments, downy kind of stuff, like you find in Sinusoropteryx, okay? So where does Sinusoropteryx show up in the fossil record? First appearance of these kinds of structures are in the Cretaceous, lower Cretaceous. What about a true feather, like an Archaeopteryx? Those first show up in the uppermost Jurassic. Or I should say upper Jurassic, some lower ones. That's not at all the prediction, right? It should be the other way around. You should see this kind of dinosaur with these really primitive feathers lower, and then you should see the ones with really good feathers higher up. Now, once again, the evolutionists can say, well, maybe that's because of just preservation bias. And certainly that comes into play, right? Um, you know, you've got to have the right environments to preserve feathers and, and things like that. I agree with that. But the point is, the actual fossil record right now does not support the narrative of more primitive feathers evolving the more complex feathers as you go up the fossil record. Okay. Additionally, what's interesting is if you look at these deposits in China where you find things like Sinusoropteryx, you find tons and tons of different kinds of dinosaurs and birds with feathers on them and all kinds of different feathers just simultaneously, ta-da, right there. And that's really, really interesting, right? That's very unexpected. Like you'd expect these things to like slowly evolve and go in different directions. And over time, you start accumulating more and more birds. No, it's like a big explosion of like, oh, you want a bird? Here's some birds. Like you want some feathered dinosaurs? Here's some feathered dinosaurs. And they're just all over the place there. And that's really, really interesting and fits much better with the idea of a creation model where these things are suddenly being buried by a flood, right? And being preserved in that way. The final thing I'll note about responding to the evolutionist about um, birds evolving from dinosaurs comes back to our original question. How do you actually make a non-flying animal fly? How do you develop a feather? And these have been excellent questions since before we even had Archaeopteryx, right? And I think they're still excellent today. Any narrative you can imagine for the evolution of feathers or flight is kind of silly and ends up bordering on the Markianism, right? I mean, paleontologists talk about feathers evolving from scales, which first of all, it's like, man, how does that even happen, right? But then they talk about it as like, oh, it first evolved for insulation and then was co-opted into a flying apparatus. But if we're being honest, that's kind of just a reductionist fairy tale that divorces an object's function from its form or design, right? I mean, 
Um, the same kind of thing has been said about eyes, right? How did eyes evolve? And they've got these, well, it was originally used for this, and then it just so happened to be useful for that and everything. And um, I, I don't remember the guy who said it, but there, there was one um, person who said, you know, I don't think it's unreasonable to believe that the eye was made for seeing. <laughs> At the end of the day, it's clearly designed to do that thing. So why am I trying to imagine this, this kind of bizarre way that it could originally not be for seeing and then it becomes for seeing? It's very strange. It's very unusual. It's just easier to say, no, it's designed to do what it does, right? Um, we see this with objects all the time. And it's, what's really funny is when you read paleontology papers and they'll be studying some creature from the past and they'll say, hey, that thing's mouth kind of looks like a saw or that thing, um, its arm kind of works like a ratchet or something. And they'll talk about that with design and they'll talk about it with design and explain it with design and use engineering with it and everything. It's like, that sounds like design to me. That doesn't sound like it's just evolving by chance. Um, panaceous feathers are designed for flight and birds and bats and pterosaurs are all amazingly engineered to get off the ground and stay in the air. And I think anytime we try to invent naturalistic scenarios to try and explain these expertly designed systems, we start approaching the philosophically absurd. Um, Thomas Nagel said it well, I'm going to paraphrase him here, um, that, that he was saying, you know, it's amazing that we ever ended up uh, with Darwinism being as prominent as it was. Um, and he says, it's an amazing narrative of the triumph of um, this theoretical thinking over top of common sense. Um, and it's true. I mean, when you stop and think about it for a while, you realize like, no, this isn't how things work. That's how nature is. That's how design works. Um, and it's because of necessity that they must argue that these things can evolve, um, even though we don't really see evidence for them evolving. Um, or even understand how they could evolve. So let me wrap this whole thing up. Okay, I would say um, we're going to conclude some major points here. I want you to take away from this. Hey, number one, there are fossils of dinosaurs with feathers. We've called these animals dinosaurs for a long time. They have all the anatomical traits of being a dinosaur, and they also have feathers. And I'm okay with that as a creationist. I have no problem with that at all. And I don't think you should either. These fossils don't pose some kind of insurmountable challenge to creationism. This is just understanding more of how God designed the world. And that's exciting and it's cool. And we should give him glory as a result. Now, listen, that being said, there are still major problems with the idea that birds evolved from dinosaurs for the evolutionary model. Yes, we acknowledge that there's feathered dinosaurs. That's not a slam dunk for evolution. I think a lot of the same problems they've always had, they still have. Um, and we noted some of these. Number one, there is discontinuity in nature. As much as you want to imagine a grand tree of life, and, and in some ways that does help us understand the categorization of life, but in terms of an actual um, just complete spectrum of living things, of slow and gradual evolution from thing to thing, you don't see that in the fossil record. You can detect real entities that are discrete and discontinuous from other entities. Secondly, we can talk about biostratigraphy. The fossils aren't in the right order to tell the story. Um, now, that could change as we discover more fossils, and I realize that that's the case, but as of right now, it doesn't match the story, and that's the point, is that you can't say, oh, look, it's told in the rocks. It's not told in the rocks. If you want to believe that story, you have to assume certain things about the rocks that you actually can't see. And then finally, um, I still think the origin of feathers and flight both pose a really, really big challenge to the evolutionary model. I just don't see how these things could evolve. Now, you could say, well, that's just because you have a small imagination. And sure, okay, I'm fine with that. Um, but we use this kind of reasoning all the time, right? I don't go and buy lottery tickets because I realize I have a really you know, low chance of getting that, right? Um, I think we we recognize, you know, if, if um, you know, my child builds something, which is cool out of Legos or something like that, and is like, oh, this is a chair you can sit on. I'm like, I don't really know about that. And I can do tests on it to determine it, certainly. Um, but that's where the historical sciences get tricky, right? Um, how do I test whether feathers can evolve? How do I test whether animals can become flying animals? Um, and I think that's where the burden of proof is on them um, to show that this is possible um, for me to believe something that seems so fanciful to me um, and far-fetched. So, you know, just to kind of wrap up again, um, all we talked about here I don't see 
the case for birds evolving from dinosaurs to be as strong as is presented in the evolutionary um, narrative. As a creationist, I think we see ample evidence that there are distinct created kinds. I think that there are feathers on some dinosaurs, and that's cool and gives God glory. Um, but at the end of the day, that doesn't mean we've figured everything out. There are still challenges in the creation perspective as well. And that's why um, I and other scientists like me, both here at Masters University, as well as in the creation biology society and the creation movement as a whole, um, we want to focus on creation model building. Instead of just trying to poke holes in the evolutionary model, we want to say, hey, what do feathered dinosaurs mean? How many created kinds of feathered dinosaurs are there? How do we understand these things? Why would God make them this way? We can start thinking through all those kinds of things and start thinking about, okay, how were they preserved? Are these actually flood layers? All that kind of fun stuff. And we can assume the truth of the Bible and go out and do our science. And that's exciting. And that's what I want to challenge um, you with. Maybe you don't want to become a scientist. Um, maybe, you know, you're not interested in that, but you're just, you enjoy science, you know, or maybe you are a student who wants to become a scientist, or you know someone who's like that. Hey, get out there and make some discoveries. You can be confident in the word of God. You don't have to be scared of the evolution worldview. You can go out there and try to understand and give God glory. And that's all I've got for you on birds and dinosaurs and how to think through them. Well, thank you very much. Um, I think that was uh, quite a lot. And um, <laughs> maybe for some folk, um, a lot of um, new insights, especially about then uh, the the being the real uh, feathered dinosaurs. Sorry, uh, being uh, really feathered. You know, like um, that's one of the main things you uh, used to uh, be reading a lot about. Um, some kind of denial of that. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the of, of the questions. Um, we received here um, uh, goes about that as well. Um, so I think it's um, a good moment to switch to uh, asking uh, some questions from the public. Um, I, th I think a few of the questions that came in during the presentation have already been answered in some sort of sense. So uh, we can uh, skim those a bit. Um, but talking about the feathered dinosaurs, uh, we have a question from uh, Delishon.nl who asked, um, and uh, he says, in case it isn't really discussed, it, I think it was discussed, but maybe you can elaborate a bit on it. Um, mm -hmm. What what kind of arguments do uh, several creationists um, come up with who deny feathers on dinosaurs? Dinosaurs, sorry. Yeah, so we, we discussed that a little bit. Um, so... You, you will have some people that that will try to say, you know, somehow that the fossils are fake. Um, and that's a very minor component of the community. Um, I think the two kind of major positions that you see, one is that um, we're misinterpreting some of these structures as feathers when they're really not. Um, so especially the kind of fluffy kind of stuff that doesn't yeah, look like, like a filament. traditional... Yeah, yeah. Like when you think about like a feather, you think of like a quill, you know, like that kind of thing you write with. And, um, as opposed to like the little fluffy stuff. Um, so that kind of, they'll take the approach that those are some kind of other structure that aren't feathers, right? Maybe yeah. it's scales or maybe it's, um, decay, um, that kind of stuff. Um, the other position is that, um, what I said later that they'll acknowledge there are real feathers on these creatures, but anytime a creature has feathers on it, they'll call it a bird. Um, yeah. and so it gets a little bit, um, confusing because there's even one instance where a researcher said that some ornithomimus skeletons are birds and other ones of the same genus are actually dinosaurs. And I'm like, if we're that bad at our job that you know, we're calling the same thing, um, yeah. sometimes it's a bird, sometimes it's a dinosaur. I just, I have a hard time with that. So I think at the end of the day, um, a lot of those challenges um, I think seemed more likely and believable, especially earlier on. But as we've discovered more and more fossils, um, I think it's kind of inescapable that there are creatures that we call dinosaurs that do have feathers on them. Yeah. And, and suppose um, 
a while back there was some uh, talk about uh, t-rex having feathers or not mm -hmm. i suppose it would have been uh, like that you know uh, it, I, I believe uh, they now came up with the conclusion it didn't have it as of yet but yeah so i mean a, a bit bit of a difficult position then if you call yeah. that a bird <laughs> yes if you call a t-rex a bird i think what does bird mean at that point right yeah um you know when it comes to feathers on on t-rex i mean a lot of these most of our dinosaur fossils don't have preserved skin or whatever's on the skin right that's very rare to find the integument preserved um so t-rex there's possibly some skin patches um they've been described some people have argued they might actually be from some turtles that were buried next to the t-rex and it's, there's still kind of some debate with that but we do have other tyrannosaurids with skin impressions for sure um and they've got scales we also have some the bigger group tyrannosauroidea from china that do show the kind of fuzzy featheriness on them um so you know could it be that T-Rex as a juvenile had some of this fuzzy stuff and as it got older and as a bigger animal, it doesn't need it for insulation or things like that. And so it's not there anymore. Um, yeah, I mean, that's possible. The thing is we just don't have the, the nice, like completely laid out T-Rex with all of the integument along the entire body. I mean, yeah. we just don't. So it's, it's hard to say for sure what it had. Well, that's, I think that's, that's as, as, as clear as you can get. Um, <laughs> Uh, also from uh, Delishon uh, about uh, the China fossils, you also mentioned those, so we could be uh, we could be a bit short about it. But um, you also mentioned Archie Raptor, which was a fake. Mm -hmm. Now there is a bit of a stain on everything from China, I think maybe since then. Um, and how how do you think about fossils from China? Are they reliable in general or? Right. Maybe not. So I think it's worth saying there is, there are people that make fake fossils still today, and it's not just China, but they have the same problem in Germany and in um, Brazil. Anywhere you've got really well preserved stuff that comes out of the ground, people will find one that's not so great, and they're like, "Okay, let me make this better." Right? <laughs> and they'll add to it. So um, the typical there are ways to see through this. Um, so a lot of times they're using plaster, and if you just use UV light, you can distinguish what's real bone, what's not. Um, other times it's more complicated, but you can use CT scans. You can use all kinds of different, um, things to help you figure out what is real and what is not real. And, um, the, the main concern when you're talking about is a fossil real or not is typically, did you get it from a dealer, right? A lot of the Chinese fossils coming out now are dug out by paleontologists in China from the museum and are taking them back there. Right. So there are still people that, you know, farmers that find them or, or dealers that, that find them. Same thing, in, in, like I said, in Brazil and in Germany. But, um, you know, a lot of these have been actually found by researchers in the field. Hey, I have no problem assuming that's a real that's a real fossil. No, I, I get that. Um, and and it, it doesn't make anything from a dealer suspicious, uh, uh, you know, um, immediately but right it raises, it raises more doubt yeah mm -hmm. um thank you well we have uh, martin the book um and he asks something i think you already mentioned as well with the geologic column mm -hmm. um so uh, i'll try to um yeah maybe fast forward the question a bit uh, to something more continuous uh, on, on the same thing like uh, because he, he asks us, um, uh, do the locations in the geolog geologic column uh, where they found these supposedly evolved dinosaurs support their theory? Do, do they discern a sort of timeline? And you showed that Archaeopteryx is below, um, uh, what's the other one? Cynosaurus? Uh, yeah, Cynosaurus, yeah. So, um, and that reminded me of something sometimes called the uh, the grandfather paradox <laughs> like uh you can't be older than your than your granddad right so um if if dinosaur sauroptrix is I, I believe they dated it about 125 million years ago yeah. and then archaeopteryx uh, 153 mm -hmm. something like that yeah. then it can be that archaeopteryx evolved from Cynosauroptrix. That's that's the main 
reasoning, I, I believe creationists then um, uh, involve. Now we have, of course, the uh, the story of you know branches, uh, side branches surviving, mm -hmm. and then you get into the discussion of um, um, what's a transitional fossil, like the the um, most times evolutionists say, well, a transitional fossil is anatomically transitional, like it has mosaic features, mm -hmm. some descended, some uh from from some uh other ones and and some uh, uh still um uh in a sort of developing state but it has a bit of this and a bit of that and then it's anatomically in between some other uh kinds of animals but that doesn't necessarily mean it's a direct ancestor or descendant sure. and then one branch can outlive another one and then you have a fossil you know in an upper layer then mm -hmm. so how do you uh, think um, that that story goes because creationists mostly mean with the transitional fossil uh, uh, a descending line gradually. sure yeah and that's a good point and, and i tried to um to bring that out in what i was saying um but yeah, I mean, like you can have, you know, when I've when I've talked to Bob Bacher about this stuff before, he's an evolutionist, you know, and he'll say, well, we still have possums today, you know, and his point being like possums are more like kind of ancestral marsupial mammal, you know, in a lot of ways, very similar to kind of what a, an ancestral mammal might be like in the early, you know, Cenozoic. Um, and they just have continued on, you know, with very few changes, right? So I think um, the idea there is to say, you know, as you currently look at the fossil record, it doesn't show us the nice transition that you might expect, like you would for horses or whales or something like that, where you've got what looks like a really good sequence right there. Um, this one, the fossils are kind of jumbled up um, and they're not in the order you'd predict. That doesn't mean that there are other fossils out there that we just haven't found that, that fill in those gaps there. And it could be, but I'm just saying, as you currently see it, it actually doesn't support what um, the story that you're trying to tell. So kind of following up with that, I see Martin's other question about, um, do they only show up in the Mesozoic and upward, not at all in the Paleozoic? Yeah. And that's where I do want to say, you know, if you, if you zoom out, right, and you look at the big picture, yeah, I could see how it matches the evolutionary model, right? That you've got, you know, fish and then amphibians and then reptiles and then birds, right? Um, but when you zoom in and look at the details, it's not anywhere where it should be. Um, and that overall pattern of, you know, fish, amphibian, reptile, bird, mammal kind of thing. Um, you know, there are other creationist reasons why we think that pattern might show up dealing with Noah's flood and different things like that in terms of how the animals would be buried. Um, and so it's important to realize that um, you can have multiple stories that can explain the same data. And, um, you know, we see this all the time in a courtroom, right? That's that's what happens in a courtroom is you have prosecution and defense that take the same piece of evidence and they tell two different narratives about it. Um, and so we have to kind of figure out which one is the better narrative overall. Um, so we shouldn't be shocked when something does match up with an evolutionary prediction, just like some things match up with a creationist prediction. But that doesn't mean those predictions are automatically true. No, and, and that's what you uh, what you're saying about predictions i think that's a, a nice um, feature to be discerning between the storytelling like uh, with, which which story uh, fits fits best well you, you can test it with a prediction probably best and of course it's also maybe about um, trying to find something not um, confirming something but just uh, um, falsifying stuff mm. so if you can say well if this or that is is found then we falsify one of the two stories and then right. that's what you're looking for maybe um yeah so what you said about the the, the different uh, groups and and um, not the gradually um um uh, evolving so to speak mm -hmm. uh, fossils like archaeopteryx you have about 12 specimens now Yep. And found, I assume, in different locations on the world? Uh, they're all from the same place, actually. So they're all from uh, the Solnhofen limestone in Germany. Yeah. Okay. Well, because that's that's telling us a lot, I think. 
you know, because if it if it really was some kind of evolving from one ancestral state to a uh, next, uh, uh, how how big of a coincidence is it that we all find them exactly in the same state, you know? Mm. Um, but if you're talking about one location, then it makes more sense maybe that it's, it's, it's the same same kind of animal in the same kind of environment. Sure. Yeah. I mean, the fossil record is a series of environments stacked on top of each other, right? Um, and they're very sudden changes most of the time when you move um, zone to zone. And that's why the early history of geology was catastrophist. When you look, go back to, um, you know, people like uh, Georges Gouillet, that he's looking at it and he's saying, hey, I see this thing and that's wiped out and then this thing and it's wiped out and that's how he saw the geologic column and when the uniformitarians came in um with lyell and and their thinking um you know stephen jay gould has a great quote about this in one of his essays where he says you know the uniformitarians weren't more scientific right they were actually doing more storytelling um because they were constantly saying well yeah there's this but there's like a bunch of time between this and this you know and they were the the reason they won out at the end of the day is because they had a better narrative overall than the catastrophist that was just saying boom 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 yeah. but they were actually reading the fossil record less literally um and the rock record less literally if you read it literally which is i think we should do for the most part um you see these sudden appearances and disappearances of groups and like i was saying for the stuff in china with the fossil birds i mean just tons of different types of birds and feathered dinosaurs just show up surprise here we are and then they're gone, you know, and that's not, I think, what the naturalistic evolutionary model would predict um, in terms of what they'd expect to see in the fossil record. No, no, because uh, otherwise you'd be basing your science on what's not there. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, we have we have another interesting question from uh, Delishong.nl. Um, I'll translate it. Um, we see now uh, how birds fly with two wings. Now, how would we think that birds mm -hmm. with four wings would have flown like Microraptor? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the original reconstructions of Microraptor, they had it like all its arms and legs straight out <laughs> side, kind of like a biplane. Um, and the thing, I mean, the hips aren't going to allow it to do that anyway, but it's kind of a silly, um, it's fun to think about, but it doesn't seem like something that could exist. So. There have been several studies working on um, how different Mesozoic birds would have flown um, from Confucius Ornus to Microraptor to Archaeopteryx. Um, and, you know, when I say birds, I mean flying because, um, yeah, I guess Microraptor is a dromaeosaur. So birds and feathered dinosaurs, how they would have flown. And um, the thing is, it looks I mean, there's kind of some difference in the studies. You'd have to go into the technical paper to, to see exactly how they work it out. but the legs probably are not involved. They're not flapping, certainly. Um, they may be involved in some other aspects of flight with, with directional things. Um, and we do today, sometimes you can get birds that will have flight feathers on the legs. Um, so like you can breed pigeons to have um, feathers come off on the feet and legs um, that are big feathers, like like what are on the wings. Um, so it's, it's possible. Um, it's just, uh, I don't think they'd actually be like flapping their legs or anything like that. Um, they're, they're probably used more like maybe like a rudder or something. I don't know. I'm not an aerodynamics person, so I can't speak to that. But like I said, there are several studies you can look into, um, that, uh, they have looked at that and they've built computer models. They've built physical models. They've done all kinds of stuff looking at how Microraptor and some of these animals would have flown. Yeah, well, it, it is interesting to think about because if it really wasn't that, you know, helpful for flight, then what did it do there? If for if yeah. evolutionary speaking, <laughs> you know, I mean, how can that be preserved then if it's just hindrance instead of? Well, I mean, yeah, that's that's where it could be, there could be other things it's used for, like display, right? I mean, like a peacock's tail doesn't help it fly at all, um, but it's got other reasons for being there. And so it, it could be, I think it does provide some kind of benefit in flight, but I just don't remember, like I said, I'm not, I'm not that kind of paleontologist. And so um, you'd have to go back and read the literature to see it. Well, at least it didn't, it didn't use it like a dragonfly or something. No, <laughs> definitely not like a dragonfly. Yeah. Um, well, that's I, th I think that's uh, that's clear enough uh, on that. Um, um, Martin uh, asks: um, Are there fossils with toothless beaks? 
and some dinosaur characteristics all in one. Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming he means toothless beaks in a bird, but having dinosaur characteristics also. Um, I mean, yeah, the truth I, I is... Think a combination of, of, of no, teeth, no teeth, but dinosaurish. Sure, yeah. So, um, you know, the truth is, I was going to say, all birds have dinosaur characteristics and all dinosaurs have birds characteristics, right? Just like we said, all living things share things in common. That's not, that's not shocking. Um, there are some Mesozoic birds that are toothless. So I'm thinking of Confucius Ornus right now as a good example of that. Um, and um, it has, you know, clawed digits also, just like Archaeopteryx. Um, and it, uh, it does have a pygo style, so it doesn't have the long bony tail. Um, but you know, other features, like we already said, they have in common things like hollow bones and a furcula wishbone, even T-Rex has a, has a wishbone. Um, so there's a lot of features that we previously thought of as uniquely bird features, but we've discovered are, are pretty common in a lot of our dinosaurs. Um, and so it's not shocking to find animals that have combinations of those things, um, inside of them. Yeah. And, uh, and, and that, that goes back to your, um, uh, your point about uh, re, re, uh, look, have, have another look at our assumptions, right? Like yeah. what's in the name, we call this a bird and, and we don't call that a bird, but who determines uh, what to call something, you know, it's, it's all right. in the end up made up, uh, made up uh, by, by, by people, hmm. how, how we decide to call something. Um, maybe there's more names to have been <laughs> invented in the yeah. end to call everything the right thing um yeah so i am as as far as i can see that's the questions we have from the audience now sure. uh, if i if i make a comment on what you just said um yeah because I, I think you're right um so much of it is is arbitrary in terms of where we've decided to draw those lines but at the same time i think there are real design patterns God put in in nature. Like we talked about mammal, right? Or bird. Um, but where those lines go gets fuzzy um, as we learn more about nature, right? And um, I think, you know, as you as you were raising a point, like, yeah, what if, what if none of these animals were extinct, right? What if Linnaeus had seen all these creatures? Would he have created the same designations? I don't know. I don't know that he would. Um, I think it's very likely that some of these things we would have called birds, or maybe we would have put birds in a bigger group that included some reptiles, but not other reptiles. I don't know what we would have done. Um, but those things are a different question than the question of created kinds, um, which yeah. is what I was trying to bring up before. And, and, and perhaps you could also say, you say um, the fact that Linnaeus did make all these groupings and was able to do it um, sort of doesn't fit with evolution gradually. Mm -hmm uh having one thing going on to another yep. because how would you make a group then yes absolutely so, yeah, I, I, oh we have another question uh what would be your wish for the future regarding your field of research oh wow that's a great question um i mean i'd love to see more creationist paleontologists show up and geologists too um I would like to see people branch into other areas. Um, I I never really wanted to work on feathered dinosaurs, but I've become that guy. Um, and I, I'm interested in more in pterosaurs and in kind of more obscure um, fossil reptiles and stuff. Um, but someone needed to go after this and, and I became the person for that. Um, I'd love to see creationists especially address biostratigraphy. I'd love to see future researchers getting these questions of, you know, why do we have fossils in the order that we do throughout the geologic column? You know, hey, we're talking about birds and dinosaurs, whatever. Um, what about like single-celled organisms or things like trilobites or conodonts that have really, really fine stratigraphy where you can take the same conodont in Europe and match it up to one in North America and be convinced you're in the same geologic um strata you know or not necessarily strata but the, the same time um that's really really interesting and we know it works because oil companies have been using it for over 100 years um and yet there's been very very little creationist research on it i think most of the creationist research with dating has dealt with the 
radiometric side of things, you know, looking at you know, radiocarbon and potassium argon and uranium dating, I'd love to see some creations start working on the biostratigraphy um, issues. And that's where I think we could make some really cool new contributions um, to science and to our understanding of the world. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, uh, I read, um, well, uh, let's get it. <clears throat> Here we have um, like um, oh yeah this, this book from yeah. uh, Andrew Schmeling and he's yep. talking about I don't know which page so I won't waste your time looking it up but <laughs> about uh, he he has some diagram in it with um, some kind of explanation why we find certain fossils in certain places uh, on top of each other like density like locomotion, like intelligence, mm. like where, where were they environmentally, um, ecological zones, all the, those kind of things. Um, but it always seems to me a bit of a, a sell, some some cheap, cheap way of getting rid of the problems because, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's in general, maybe a sort of explanation, but what about all the times it doesn't work like that you know right and yeah. um so yeah i think you're right there should be some um experts focusing on those issues and yeah with, with flock models as well i think you know yes some, some yep more in europe uh, we had some more um um uh views about about a, a lot of layers being post flood and mm. some uh, folk like uh, i think michael Ord, for example or um, tim clary they have very recent layers so to speak yes you no know, re relatively speaking uh, as uh, pointing to the flood so yeah that uh, it makes a lot of difference for your explanation i guess it does yeah absolutely and i, and I think you know, I don't, I don't want to say like, you know, um, Andrew Snelling did a bad job or anything. I think, um, he's doing great where he, you know, in his field. Um, but I think, you know, he's pulling from Leonard Brand and other people like that, that I've tried to start to answer these questions, but they've always come at it from a very broad perspective. And I think we needed to do that. That's how it always starts. Right. Is you're like, maybe it's this, maybe it's locomotion, maybe it's intelligence, maybe it's, you know, ecological zonation and there's flaws with all those. Right. I mean, in the same layers that we find all these feathered dinosaurs, we also find salamanders, you know, and bugs. And it's like, those are not equally intelligent animals. <laughs> They're not equally locomotion capable animals, you know, so it is too simplistic. Um, but I think we need those initial people suggesting hypotheses, throwing out ideas. They're great. Like that's, that's where we start the process. Now we need people to actually go in and investigate it more deeply. And, um, and that's what, you know, Andrew Snelling, I just brought him up. He's a great example of that, where people before him were kind of throwing out ideas about radiometric dating. What about this? What about that? You know, and and he and other people like him said, well, let's take it seriously and investigate it. And that was the rate project, you know, and, and work he's done since then. And um, that's what we want to see is people get um, in depth down in the nitty gritty. And I think flood modeling is what you just talked about. Fantastic example of that. Um, so much of our, our idea about where the flood started and ended is looking at these big scale really zoomed out, you know, picture, which you have to do. But we also need people getting down and looking at the details, right? And starting from the details and moving up. And um, that's where we're lacking. You know, we've got a lot of people that can that can um, think about big picture stuff. But we also need, um, you know, people to get down in the field and actually go and dig up fossils and look at rocks and, and collect data. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and just to be sure I, I this is part two of uh, of uh, two books it's about um, uh, well almost 1100 uh, pages so Andrew Snelling did a great job in being very yeah. uh, into detail the, 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 this was just one sort of side thing you know in the, right that's what we say like we need some focus on it and mm -hmm. yeah um oh the, there's um, still another question here um regarding um 
new researchers. Uh, now, suppose we have uh, new creationist researchers. Uh, where can they apply? Well, I don't know if that's something for you to, to answer. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there are very few universities or colleges in the world that are going to be able to give you science degrees from a young earth creationist perspective. Um, you don't have to do that. I mean, you can go to a, a secular school and lots of creationist scientists have done that. Um, it presents some challenges for sure. Um, not only just animosity from people potentially, um, but also you don't necessarily get trained in how to think as a creationist. And um, it can be feel overwhelming with the data, you know, the, and the hypotheses piling up on you. Um, yeah. Hey, if you're a creationist, I would strongly encourage you go to a creationist school. Um, and so there's, you know, there's a few, there's two with um, really well-developed uh, undergrad geology programs. So Cedarville University in Ohio, and then Masters University where I teach in California. Um, Loma Linda University as a Seventh-day Adventist school, they also have technically have an undergrad geology program, but they focus more on the graduate school side of things. Um, and they've got different perspectives um, going on there among um, uh, students and faculty and things. Um, there are other young earth schools that would have um, biology programs as well. Um, so schools like Bryan College or in uh, Tennessee or Truett McConnell in Georgia. You'll notice all these I'm saying are in the United States. Um, as far as I know, I may be wrong about this, I don't know about a school a university outside of the United States that would have a young earth creationist perspective and offer science degrees. Um, and they could be out there and I just don't know them, but, um, you know, in, in the U S I named those ones also Liberty university in Virginia. Um, but there aren't very many, it's just a handful. Um, there's probably some I forgot, but I would say, look, if you're interested in this at all, the best thing for you to do is to start getting in touch with people who are doing this stuff, just get to know them go to creation science conferences. Um, and, you know, a creation apologetics events are great, like at churches and things. Um, but if you want to get into the nitty gritty of it, go to a creation science conference, come over to the United States, go to one that's hosted in Europe, um, you know, groups like Biblical Creation Trust or um, Core Academy of Science, um, you know, that are hosting some of these things, as well as um, Logos Institute, um, you know, where people are actually trying to um, do the science side of it. That's what you want to be looking at um, mm -hmm. as opposed to just doing the apologetic side of it, which is great, like I said, but if you want to be a scientist, you got to get in the science side of it. And so sure. um, great place to start international conference on creationism this summer. If you can find your way over to Ohio, um, you know, it's a, it's going to be a really, really amazing um, opportunity to see real creation science being done and to talk to creationist researchers. Yeah, I think that's that would be great. I, I, I'm afraid I'm not able to do it. But mm -hmm. if anyone listening thinks, well, I want to be be more involved, then that's uh, I think a great a great starting place. Well, I have some uh, some thank yous from uh, our viewers, uh, at least a few of our viewers. Uh, Anitje seventy five, thank you very much. Martin the book, thank you, Dr. McLean, for your interesting presentation, and Delishon.nl. Uh, in Dutch, he said, uh, thanks for this interesting presentation. Um, yeah, I, I would like to um, to join them in uh, thanking you. It was, uh, I think, for a lot of people um, even more involved in this uh, uh, very uh, interesting as well, uh, as for people not so um, familiar with the subject. Um, and I, I think we have some great insights now. Uh, maybe that not everybody had so thank you very much um god bless you god bless your work god bless you too um for now um i will um switch back to um dutch for some uh, announcements if you don't mind and then um, we close it up so um switching to dutch now um Volgende week, dinsdag 14 februari, dan is er uh, in de beeld een avond met uh, dokter Matjan Paul en Ruben Jorsma. Een open avond over schepping en evolutie. Uh, er zijn ook uh, cursisten die uh, de schepping en uh, evolutiecursus uh, van dokter Paul gevolgd hebben. En naast een presentatie van Ruben Jorsma is er ook veel ruimte voor vragen over dit onderwerp. U kunt zich aanmelden 
via logos.nl en de link wordt in de chat gedeeld. En op 11 maart volgende maand is er een heel interessante situatie, want dan hebben we een debat tussen een atheïst en een christen over macro-evolutie. En daar is beperkt ruimte voor het publiek. Voor details uh, en uh, voor aanmeldingen kunt u op logos.nl kijken. Um, en dan is er nog tenslotte voor um, kinderen, ouders en leerkrachten misschien uh, extra interessant. Een dagtrip naar het Bijbelmuseum in, in uh, Wuppertaal, net over de grens in Duitsland. Uh, die is gepland voor uh, zaterdag 10 juni. En ook daarover is meer informatie op logos nl te vinden. Um, ja, en dan natuurlijk nog even um, het, 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 de missie van Logos. Die uh, kunt u natuurlijk ook altijd steunen met een gift, um, zodat ook dit soort organisaties, uh, of uh, uh, sorry, dit soort um, activiteiten kunnen blijven worden georganiseerd. Um, het kan natuurlijk via een uh, gift via de bank of via Logos.nl, maar er is ook een QR-afbeelding in beeld. Um, tenminste, ja, volgens mij zien we die nu in beeld, inderdaad. Um, en natuurlijk, ik had het al even genoemd aan het begin van de avond, um, het Logos YouTube kanaal kunt u natuurlijk altijd een abonnement opnemen, zodat u altijd op de hoogte blijft van dit soort evenementen. Hartelijk dank voor uw aandacht. En in het bijzonder nogmaals dank voor dokter McLean. En graag tot de volgende keer weer.